Hello everyone, uh, nice to talk to you all. So this class, we're going to continue our topics on the fundamentals of environmental engineering and science. So specifically, we're going to talk about the solid waste engineering. And again, before we introduce the new contents, let's again do a recap of our last class. So last class, we introduced uh, meteorology and its impact on the air pollution, right? So uh, we introduced that although the air, uh, air pollutant emission is very important, but when we talk about the influence or impact of these air pollutant on, the, on human or on community, we have to think about the transport of these air pollutants. So first we introduce the wind, right? The, the wind can be generated by a pressure difference and also the, the relatively, uh, the temperature of two regions, right? So we can create this so-called regional wind, right? So the regional wind um, simply means that um, the, um, the temperature difference, for example, from the sea surface and uh, the uh, land surface is going to cause a pattern of the wind directions and then further affect the, um, the transport of these air pollutants. And there's also global wind pattern, and this is also because of temperature, uh, simply um, due to um, the, uh, the situation that near the equator, the temperature is higher because there is direct sunlight or perpendicular to the surface. While near the polar region, the sunlight is angled, right? So the radiation or the energy is going to be lower. So further, we introduced atmospheric stability, and this is going to also affect the transport of air pollutants. So basically, if we have very stable air, then the air pollutants will get trapped in the, near the surface of the ground, and then this is going to cause some problems in the um, transport of the air pollutant. And at the end of the class, we introduce a stack design. So um, more specifically, this is talking about the transport of air pollutants coming out of a stack. So I didn't got time to introduce the um, detailed procedures for solving these problems. So here, I'll just go through these procedures again, but without detailed numbers here. So basically, the, the system we're talking about has a ge geometry that looks like this. Okay, so we have a stack that has certain height, right? This is the real height of the stack. <clears throat> and then the air pollutants are going to get emitted from top of it. And then, so we designed a parameter which is called the effective stack height. So basically the air pollutants will first travel upwards and then follow the wind direction, which is along the y direction, okay? Uh, which is along the x direction, all right? So that's why we designed a uh, effective stack height, where we have to include the um, vertical transport at the beginning of the transport, okay? And then, as the air pollutants are further being transported, they are going to get expanded both in the x, uh, both in the y direction and z direction. So basically, um, the transport will follow Gaussian distribution, where the concentration in the center is always the highest, while the concentration at the edge are lowest, right? So they are going to follow and the, um, the Gaussian distribution along the y direction and also the Gaussian distribution along the z direction. So what this equation tries to solve is basically at any surface monitoring point. Let's say we're interested in the air pollutant concentration, which is 10 kilometers downwind, the stack, right? And also uh, at the ground. So what this means is that we have to know what is x what is y? And here, since we're measuring at the ground, z is equal to zero. So we can basically try to look at what is the air um, pollutant concentration at any x, y, uh, x and y coordinates while the z equal to zero. Okay. So if we look at this equation, here, uh, what are the inputs? We need to know what is x, we need to know what is y, and also we need to know what is the height of the stack, which is the effective height of the stack. Okay. So, for example, if you want to know um, 10 kilometers downwind, but also in the y direction, which is one kilometer away, then the x will be equal to 10, right? Y will be equal to one, all right? So <clears throat> basically we can use this equation to solve for the air pollutant concentration in there. And also why we're interested in that is, um, so if we set up a monitoring station at this specific location, and then we can measure the concentration there, 
So we can use this equation to trace back what is the emission rate of the air pollutant, which is the E value here. So basically you can see in this equation that we have several unknowns or several parameters determining the concentrations at this specific S and Y location. We have E, which is the emission rate, okay? And we have SY and SZ, which are the standard deviation of the uh, spread of the uh, air pollutant along the y direction and along the z direction. So remember, the dispersion happens in y and z direction. Okay, and um, also we have u. U is the uh, wind direction along this uh, downwind direction. So basically, that's why the air pollutants will travel along this x direction. Right. So this is just the wind um, wind velocity. Okay. So you see that once we have these three parameters here, um, we can basically solve for what is the concentrations, right? We know what is x, what is y, we just plug them in, right? And then we should be able to solve for these uh, concentrations at any specific location, right? So, um, <clears throat> so by using this equation, uh, further we need to calculate um, basically what is the uh, H, which is the height of this uh, system, of the, the effective height of this uh, stack, right? So, um, so the effective height can be calculated by um, by summing up the actual height of the stack and this delta H, which is the additional height above this stack. And we can use this equation. You can see that this additional height is related with what is the um, velocity at the outlet of the stack, right? Because the air pollutants are emitted with certain vertical velocity, which is Vs, okay? It's related with what is the diameter of the stack, what is the wind velocity, what is the temperature of the stack and temperature of the ambient, and the atmospheric pressure, and also the diameter again, okay? So if we have all of these parameters, we can calculate H, right? And then we know the wind direction. We just need to know what is the standard deviation along the X and uh, along the Y and Z direction. So we mentioned that this is related with the atmospheric stability condition. So typically the problem will tell you whether it's during daytime or nighttime, what is the cloud condition, right? So basically you can refer to this table here to calculate or to trace what is the values of A, C, F, and D, right? So basically you can plug in these parameters, plug in the X uh, value, which is the, the distance downwind of this uh, stack, right? So you can calculate what is SY and what is SZ, okay? So um, again, you should notice that actually there should be a typo in this uh, in this table because the A here is not dependent on the X in, uh, It's not dependent on the X value. So basically if the X is smaller than one kilometer You can calculate that based on CDF if X is larger than one kilometer you can calculate that uh, um, Based on these CDF values the A is always the same. Okay, so you can calculate the standard deviation. Now you can plug in everything to calculate what is the concentration at any specific location downwind of this stack. And also, if you know these concentrations, if you know the concentration, you can trace back to calculate what is the um, emission rate uh, coming out of the stack. Okay, so um, I don't have any numbers to plug in this uh, calculation process, but um, by, by doing working on the uh, homework problems or and also the example problem in the textbook, you can get more of a feeling in terms of how we can use these equations to evaluate the air pollutants that emitted coming out of a stack. Okay. So um, since we're getting into the final week of our two six zero one class. Uh, we have to finish up on the final chapters, okay? So until now, we talked about the uh, water treatment. We talked about the wastewater treatment, air pollutants. And then uh, we mentioned that the pollution can happen in all different phase of the objects, right? We talk about liquid phase, which is the water and wastewater um, processing, right? We talk about the gas phase, which is air pollutant. So the only phase that's left is the solid waste. Okay, so starting from chapter 13, we're going to talk about the solid waste engineering and uh, hazardous waste engineering. 
okay so typically these are existing in solid phases okay so um we mentioned about solid waste actually generate a lot of solid waste by everyday life and especially right now during the covid 19 situation um, we probably generate more solid waste because we're eating um, making our meals at home right generating more solid waste so what is the characteristics of the solid waste so um, here in this class we're going to mainly focus on the municipal solid waste or the MSW, so we're going to use this, ac this acronym uh, quite often. So we also call them as garbage, right? So the MSW, or the municipal solid waste, can come from residential, commercial, institutional, construction, demolition, right? Civil engineering um, basically generates a lot of waste um, coming out of the constructions in there, right? So uh, municipal services, treatment plants, so on and so forth. Okay, so if you make a pie chart of all of these solid waste, you can see that a major composition of it are actually paper products. Okay, and then we have food scraps, uh, yard trimming, plastics, metal, uh, rubber, leather, right? So these gener generally will occupy a smaller fraction of the pie chart. So most of them are actually paper. And uh, in terms of the generation, um, so based on statistics of uh, 2010, um, so each person basically generate 2.01 kilogram per day. This is not a very significant amount of solid waste, right? So, um, uh, so actually 55 to 65 percent are coming from the residential, and uh, there's also low production rate from low income in fact uh, income in fam families. Okay, so. Um, Basically, there was also a plan that people want to recycle 35 by the year of, year of 2005, uh, 2005. But actually, in uh, 2010, the recycle fraction is 34.1%. Um, Basically, it's a, lo a little bit lower uh, than the expectation. Okay? So in terms of the solid waste, um, people also will categorize, or one type of it is called the uh, putressible waste. So, which means that they can uh, degrade, okay? So these uh, degradable organic matter can come from uh, kitchen stores, markets, restaurants, and so on and so forth. But while they're being degraded, they will generate bad odors. And in terms of density, they can, can have different types of density, or depend, really depends on what type of solid waste we're talking about. And also related to the age and compaction. So in terms of the solid waste management, there are uh, several rules. And I think that uh, this is the diagram that we showed um, during the first chapter here. So if we uh, try to track the lifetime of the solid waste, so they're first being generated and then they're being handled. Okay. Let me remove this. So they are being handled um, on site and also stored, right? And further, they can be transported um, to solid waste collection and then transferred to a storage fa facility. Um, and also, some of them can be um, processed, right? Some of them can even get uh, recycled, right? So um, this is product uh, utilization. So if this uh, waste solid, uh, solid waste handling and storage is already a, a central facility, then you can directly process all of these waste and also uh, reutil reutilize, right? So to recycle some of the fractions. But some of them cannot be utilized, so they will directly go to disposal, okay? So, um, so actually, these solid waste can act as a resource. So um, there are more efforts trying to recycle a lot of these solid waste because there are um, already limited source, limited resources of the major components in these solid waste. For example, the Earth's mineral deposits are quite uh, limited. And if we use more, if we just basically um, generate more of these uh, mineral deposits, it's going to harm the environment. Right? If it's not con it's recycled, then more consumption of the natural resources will happen and also will produce more uh, waste. It's going to cause an environmental impact. So we have to conserve these resources and conduct the recovery of these uh, waste. Okay, so if you have a question, why should we recycle useful materials? Then we know that it will reduce the 
consumption and also reduce the waste production. So we'll use, we'll choose C here. Okay, so this idea involves the concept of the green chemistry or the green engineering, right? So if you talk about green, then that means more environmental, right? So we will try to prevent the environmental problems before they happen. So we can select appropriate materials and manufacturing um, processes to enhance the material and energy conservation and also to minimize the adverse environmental impact. And in terms of the recycling, the modes of the recycling, there can be primary, secondary, and tertiary. It really depends on what type of solid waste we're talking about. Right? If it's primary recycling, that simply means the recycled material, they can be used uh, to form the same product. For example, the plastic bottle that we use uh, coming out of soda, uh, bottle, uh, soda, right? So they're made of the same material. They're very uh, stable. They're very endurable. So we can recycle this material after cleaning them and then manufacture those bottles again. There can be secondary recycling. So um, basically we can extract some proportion coming out of the solid waste to make different products. For example, the electronic waste. We know that there are a lot of uh, noble metals, or for example, um, gold, silver, platinum, right? Silicon, silicon is not a metal there, but it can also get recycled. So we can extract these metal and other components and make uh, other products, right? And there can be ter uh, tertiary recycling. So tertiary recycling just means to um, consume them. Basically, one way of consuming them is to uh, generate heat, right? Directly burn them and to recover the chemicals and the energy. Okay, so that's why um, for processing these solid waste, there is an idea called the compositing. So compositing means just to decompose it of these organic materials by using heat. So we break down, break down the organic matters, kill the pathogens, and also generate heat where we can uh, utilize these uh, energy. Okay, for example, this is an um, process for the decompositing facility, right? So we have blower that's pumping air inside. So the air contains oxygen, right? We can decomposite these organic matter to broke them up because if they're not being decomposited and directly dumped into the atmosphere, uh, we know that they're, since they're organic, they're going to increase the BOD of the water resources. Okay, so there's also, um, so basically this process is a batch process, right? So we pump in the air, right? After the solid waste are de decomposite, um, decomposed, right? So we take all these uh, products out of the, this reactor. So the batch reactor, the disadvantage is that we have to transport material in and take them out. The, the reactor have to be stopped. So there's also a continuous process where you use belt to transfer these uh, waste, right? And also you um, pump in air, right? The product will just also use these uh, belts to transport them out. So this is a continuous process. And similarly, we can use this design here. So this process is also called the in-vessel systems. So um, here's a question. What process is normally used in, decomp uh, in compositing? So if you uh, think back on the um, process where we pump in the air. So we're basically using the oxygen in the air to um, decompose the materials inside, right? So uh, then that's going to be aerobic. It's not anaerobic, okay? Aerobic process. So to alleviate these uh, solid waste um, problems, we can also reduce the, re uh, reduce the sources. Simply means that we generate less solid waste, okay? So we can... Um, conduct the following things. For example, reduce the quantity of the materials produced, use non-toxic materials. So that's going to be more convenient for us to process a solid waste, produce durable products. So they degrade less often. So we can use them for a very long time, right? Go paperless. If you want to receive bills, you should use uh, electronic bills, right? Um, repair and reuse, education, right? So, um, so we also mentioned that we can extract the heat coming out of the solid waste. So that's why um, people conduct these combustion processes to downgrade the solid waste. So what it does, uh, 
tries to do is convert all of those carbon to carbon dioxide, hydrogen to water, and then sulfur to sulfur dioxide. Similarly for other types of organics, we basically oxidize all of them, generate heat, and then potentially generate electricity. So as we learned uh, from the uh, NOx control, we know that the higher the temperature, the more the NOx is going to form, going to be formed, right? Um, so basically, this high temperature is going to release more NOx, right? So we need to use um, 700 Celsius, at least 700 Celsius, to burn out all the combustible materials. But if the temperature is higher, then there will be no more NOx. So this um, process that burns all of these solid waste have to go through the air pollution control, right? So we need to use proper devices to remove these air pollutants, right? So in the flame zone, typically for these uh, um, incineration process, uh, there is going to be a rapid reaction in one to two seconds to destroy these toxic compounds and produce the energy. So this is a uh, diagram of this uh, solid waste incinerator. So you can see that uh, after we introduce these um, solid waste right inside the incinerator, it's getting combusted. We can form the soil or ash coming out of the uh, combustion. And these gases are going through these air pollution control equipment, right? And then um, basically, finally, we're going to generate uh, carbon dioxide and water. But there will also be some uh, air pollutants because we know that the efficient of these air pollution control equipment is not 100%, okay? So people also designed uh, these fluidized bed incinerators where the solid waste can be just resuspended in the reactor. So there's more, uh, there's a longer residence time of these um, reactants in the air. So basically we generate them, like suspended the, these in small particles and pumping a lot of air. So it's just like bubbling air through solids. So they can be suspended in this uh, vessel here. And then once they're getting um, combusted, some of these solids can be pumped into the flue gas and then here we have a cyclone. We know that the cyclone will remove these particulates and then they can settle down and then come back to the reactor. So by recycling them in this fluidized bed reactor, we can elongate the resonance time of these solid waste and then try to extract more energy coming out of it and also conduct more complete combustion um, from these solid waste. So combustion is one form of the um, of processing these solid waste. So actually, more than half of these municipal solid waste are uh, directly dumped uh, through landfills. Okay. So if you can, if you want to design a landfill, of course you have to think a lot of think about a lot of uh, factors there. You cannot directly uh, decide to build a landfill um, nearby your house, right? So that's not landfill. That's littering. Okay. Um, so in terms of these large landfills, there are a lot of sand, uh, site considerations. For example, um, people need to think about the public opposition. No one wants to build a landfill um, beside their homes, right? And people need to, talk, need to think about the wetland or flood uh, zone because a lot of water, if they get through these um, um, solid waste, there might be some uh, wasted or polluted liquids Right? There's a, sp a specific name for those uh, waste liquid or polluted liquid there. We're going to talk about that later. And um, people also need to think about the transportation. You can't really build a uh, landfill that's really far away. Of course, people want to make these, uh, build these landfills as, as far away as possible, but we need to consider about the transportation. We need to think about the soil condition because once we form those polluted liquid, they can be transported in, uh, in soil, and then we want a smaller uh, velocity of these uh, pollutants in the soil because they might get permeated through the drinkable water, underground water, and polluted water resources. Also, we need to co consider about the groundwater level. Okay, so in terms of the operation of these land field, um, there are basically three steps, right? First, we'll spread them to basically remove or uh, remove some easily degradable com components there. And then we'll compact, so basically um, uh, form a more complex, compact structure. And then 
will pack them in the landfill. Okay, so here I have a short video regarding the uh, uh, operation of the uh, landfill. So let's try to watch through them. Okay, we can skip a little bit. Basically, after they are collected, we spread them into a specific area. We basically let the air to go through, right? To oxidize some easily uh, degradable species. So we'll weigh these trucks right, to uh, get an idea of how much solid waste we are collecting every day. This is an actual landfill we're talking about. So people do these site survey to know what is the, the soil structure, what is the soil condition there. And each of this, um, uh, this unit here is called a cell. So what this is doing is basically form a layer so that um, we said that there will be polluted liquid, right? So we don't let these liquid further permeate through the soil the underground water. Okay, so this fluted liquid is called leaching. So we'll form several layers of these uh, uh, structures here to really uh, stop the uh, penetration of this fluted liquid here, or the leachate. So this is placing the compact, compacted solid waste. will form this daily cover, which is a, a thin cover of soil above these uh, solid waste. You can put several cells above it. So finally, we have this final cover, which is a soil layer above that. And typically, this final cover is thicker compared to the daily cover. So this is uh, using a gas valve because, uh, well, because we know that the oxidation of these uh, solid waste or the anaerobic process generates a lot of gas species and we don't want explosion to happen, right? So have this well to transport these uh, gas species or extract these gas species. waste we're processing but we don't want to form these cell several days there because uh, once it's exposed to the air for a longer time then we may generate a lot of air pollutants so the daily cover is typically around 0.15 meter you can see that this is a relatively thin layer of soil we can also can have intermediate cover which is uh, can happen above several uh, layers of cell and the final cover have to be thicker simply because the, um, we want to prevent these uh, pollutant species to uh, permeate through the top cover and then generate air pollution issues. And, and the final cover is over the entire landfill. landfill. So again, uh, regarding site consideration, what should we consider when we design a landfill? Right? So we need to consider both the social and environmental impacts, determine the size and landfill, 
of the landfill based on population and properly collect and treat these landfill leachate. So all of them should be considered. So uh, this is a diagram showing how we process these uh, solid waste here. So basically you can see that each cell will finally look like this. Of course, this is using a different structure or different type of structure for processing these solid waste. But still, we're forming these daily cell here and then covering them by the daily cover. Okay. And also you can see that we have these uh, portable fans to catch the blowing paper because we know that paper can easily get uh, dispersed in the air, right? So uh, this is a side view of these, uh, uh, this landfill system. So again, you can see these different cells, right? Between them are the daily cover, right? So inside each, each cell, there are compacted solid waste. So that's after the compaction, okay? So uh, we introduce that those um, polluted liquid are called the leachate. So if you think about the composition of these leachate, they are basically very concentrated uh, polluted uh, waste stream, right? Waste stream there. So they can either come from the rainfall or the surface drainage, right? Come from uh, the groundwater and also the liquid coming out of the decomposition. And they can be very, uh, contain a, a lot of unpleasant odor there, right? So what, we, what people do is they will form these uh, geomembrane liner, which are the, basically the layer at the bottom of each cell there. Okay? They also use 0.6 meter of the compact soil liner, and they want to guarantee that the hydraulic conductivity is less than 10 to the minus 7 centimeters per second. So we want to use a very small uh, velocity or the hydraulic conductivity for these pollutants because we don't want them to penetrate through the layer right finally get into the groundwater okay so let's say this is a cell so basically we don't want the leachate to go through and then penetrate the, the uh, get into or mix with the groundwater so that's why for the leachate collection we have those pipes right if you recall in the video there are pipes to collect these liquid and transfer them into a side well here you know, to collect these liquid and in terms of the com uh, composition or the removal of these, uh, these leachate, uh, people um, can use uh, um, basically the oxidation process. You, you can use the biological or physical or chemical method, right? If you think about the composition, um, they can contain a lot of ammonia, right? Organic pollutants, which can be both COD and BOD, uh, halogenated hydrocarbons, right? heavy metals and salts. So this is another side view of this cell here. So basically, we will form these geomembrane here to, um, or the geomembrane here to prevent the uh, leachate from going through. Right. We also put in these pipes here to collect these leachate, to um, uh, centralize them through the uh, uh, through the wells that's at the side or beside these uh, beside these cells. Okay. So this is a picture showing these uh, leachate transfer pipes. So finally, uh, the landfill will cover all of these pipes, right? But people are building up these pipes in advance because finally they're going to process the uh, waste through these facilities. So if you ask the question, how is leachate being produced in the landfill or why they are being produced? So they can be produced through the surface uh, drainage, right? Coming from the storm water, rain water. They can uh, be generated through the groundwater infiltration. So the groundwater can also mix, mix up into these cells here. So they can also be generated from the uh, material decomposition. So all of them can generate these digit. Okay. So in terms of the um, landfills, they're also generating methane gas, right? Coming from the anaerobic processes, because we know that anaerobic, uh, anaerobic process generate these gaseous uh, organics, right? So uh, they are hazardous materials because they can easily cause explosion, right? They can damage crops. And, uh, um, and uh, also there are... Uh, 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 certain uh, uh, danger that might be causing combustion or the explosion there. So uh, in terms of the design of the landfill 
as we have introduced, right? It needs to be based on the population, right? Also the compacted fuel density and trash generation rate. Okay, so this is a consideration of the landfill. So um, in terms of the closure of the landfill, um, so basically we need to think about the prevent to prevent the moisture from entering the landfill. Right? We need to build these hydraulic barrier, foundation layer, and gas con control. So this is regarding the design of each, each cell of the landfill. A landfill. So finally, uh, let's quickly review our class. This is a relatively short lecture. So, um, so basically, in this class, we talk about what are the main compositions of the municipal solid waste. What is the average generation rate? based on each person, right? How much of them should be recycled? And also, um, how do we manage these solid waste? What are, what are the um, putrescible waste that's mainly coming from, right? Why should we uh, conserve and recover these resources? What is green chemistry and what is green energy? Okay, so many, how many ways are used for source reduction? And uh, for example, what are the considerations for the land site, uh, landfill site uh, selection? And what are the main pollutants of the landfill leachate? Okay, so uh, that's all for the contents of this class. And uh, feel free to let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.